low, low. And uh, thank you for coming to this um, presentation here at the uh, Northboro Library. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us there, um, 20 here close by in Westboro and 40 in Worcester and 10 in Boston. We're actually the biggest firm outside of Boston. So because there are so many of us, everybody gets to specialize. So I get to do nothing but this, which I really like doing. I like doing elder law. So this presentation is a little about law, but not, a, but not a lot. It's really about my friends, Frank and Mary. We've often talked about them and their goal to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if they're in Northboro, that means they wanna be right here. They wanna stay here. And we talked about them in our last presentation at 70 and at 80, at 70 when they were both just retiring and healthy and at 80 when they were starting to have some issues. Today, we're gonna to talk about just Mary and we're gonna assume that Frank died. Uh, and we're <coughs> talking about just Mary who back when, when Frank and Mary were 70, they had a life expectancy of, of uh, uh, Frank had a life expectancy of 14 years and at 80, he had a life expectancy of eight years and it worked out about right, he died before 90. And Mary had a life expectancy at 70 it's of 16 years and, and at 80 of not, a little over nine years. And now her life expectancy is almost five years. Um, and in this example that we're gonna to use today, we're gonna to assume that Frank and Frank, Mary was able to maintain her assets. Uh, these are the same assets that Frank and Mary had had earlier. So they've got a, still got a house. She's got a house, she's got a savings account. She now has Frank's uh, IRA. So they've got total assets of about 800,000 and Mary is now getting the social security check that Frank used to get of $2,000 a month. Um, but she's frail, she's frail and she's 50 and she's living at home. And she's got fairly simple goals. Once again, she wants to live in her house until she dies. She wants to be buried in the backyard. She wants to not run out of money, right? An important goal. She wants to leave the rest to the kids and she wants to sleep well at night. They're very straightforward goals. And when Mary is thinking forward, she's probably thinking that her life now is gonna have kind of, kind of two pieces to it. One piece where she's going to be okay, but maybe not great because she is 90, right? And then the final piece where she's probably gonna be sick for a while because as opposed to when we were growing up, remember we were growing up and people would just have a heart attack and they just die, you know, and they'd have a stroke or they'd just die. It practically never happens anymore. The, the statistic that I keep always use is that uh, in 1970, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, your chances of being dead within 14 days were about um, 33%. Today they are 3%. So it just doesn't happen. You may have a stroke or a heart attack and be much slower, um, but you're not going to die. So, so a piece of what you need to be, Mary needs to be think, will need to be thinking about is how she's going to deal with that eventually. So she wants to be for the rest of her life as healthy as she can be. She wants to be prepared to be sick and she wants to be ready to die uh, because it, it happens. So I'm, I'm going to talk a lot from a, a book by a woman named Katie Butler. You have to read this book. It's called The Art of Dying Well. Um, and each, in each chapter, she starts off the chapter by saying, so this chapter is really relevant to you if, if you identify with some of these lines. So this was a chapter called Adaptation. And I'm using that for Mary at 90. So you know you're not going to get better. You know, you kind of are how you are, and you're not going to get much better than that. People you used to help, they're now kind of helping you. Uh, you're using hearing aids or a cane or a walker. Um, you need chores, you need help getting chores done around the house or doing other stuff, groceries, taxes, dinner, right? A lot of things. Your health condition, conditions are no longer an annoyance. They have now changed your life. You're just living a different life. And you sometimes worry that you're exhausting those around you, your children, you know, the, or the folks that have been helping you out. And so, when you're in that situation, I guess the question is kind of what do you do? Now, in, in all of these presentations, uh, I've um, asked Sarah Burke or her partner, uh, Rebecca Wild Wesley, who are geriatric care managers, aging life care professionals, also called geriatric care managers, <laughs> um, um, to talk, to, to speak because they are the kind of the hidden, I want to say gem that for folks often don't talk to or don't realize they exist. They're basically people that, if you're trying to figure all this out and you're married, can try to help you figure it out in terms of kind of what your options are, you know, what you should be doing, what programs are available, a lot of different stuff. So I'm gonna ask Sarah to talk for a few minutes 
Then I'm gonna come back and talk a, a little bit about um, the program, the kind of major program for Mary at this point that is available through um, Bay Path Elder Services. And then we're gonna talk about Mary during that last year. So, Sarah. So, at this point, my Mary. Um, you just, you have, you just no, have that. I think just have that. I'm just and gonna actually, park it. Okay. Well, you know How's what, that? I'm, okay, that's fine. Is that right? Yeah, that's Good. fine. So, Mary at this point is living alone in her home that she and Frank were gonna live in until they both died and get buried in the backyard. Um, her health is not what it used to be. It turns out that Frank actually did some of the driving for her and used to be the second set of ears um, when she went to the doctor's appointment. So as a aging life care professional, I would be talking to her about, you know, how are things going? Is this really still, is your goal still to be living alone in this house? Is it working for you? Are you scared? Are you lonely? So it might be thinking about, well, maybe she, maybe Mary wants to change her goals. Maybe she wants to go to an assisted living where there are more people around to help and to socialize with and activities. Maybe Mary still wants to stay at her home, but she's not driving. So she needs some help figuring out how to get to the doctor's appointments or getting her groceries. Um, she had been doing the laundry, but now she's just sick of doing that. Um, she had been cooking meals and she doesn't want to cook for herself. So it would be helping her find places that and services that will fill in some of those holes that maybe Frank had created or Frank's loss has created these holes. Um, and it might also be going to the doctor's appointments with her so that when she hears something, she may not remember it or maybe overwhelming. So I would help him be that second set of ears and also help her understand that there are choices. I know sometimes you go to a doctor's appointment and the doctor tells you what you need to do, but there are always choices. You know, you can decide that, you know what? I'm not doing that. I'm tired of getting, being a pin cushion and I don't want to go to the lab every week. And I understand that that may have an impact on my health, but I'm just tired of doing that. So I would also be having those conversations with her. I might also connect her if she's lonely but really wants to stay at home with the senior center if she hasn't been going already. I might connect her with a companion, someone that will help her out, go grocery shopping or to a movie, things that she and Frank used to do. Um, that's, that's sort of the general, I would just support Mary in the life or to try and create the life that she would like to have. Thank you very much. And, and just as we were doing this, um, uh, Sarah Ekstrom, who's a, well, who's gonna do this, Teresa Ekstrom. <laughs> so this is my age showing. Teresa Ekstrom from Bay Path Elder Services arrived because uh, her, her boss, Christine Alessandro, who is the executive director of Bay Path, couldn't make it. Yeah. Um, but Teresa is, is going to be talking a little bit about, once again, if you're in Mary's situation, you're frail, you're at home, what are the programs that might be the most valuable to Mary during this period of her life? During this period of her life. Got it. Thanks. Hi, everybody. So let me just make sure I know how this works. Oh, I was going to say. Oh, okay. Here we go. Watch this. Forward. Oh, Back. very That's fancy. All That's Got all it. I know. All right. That's all we need. <laughs> so one of the programs that's most helpful to folks when they are wanting to stay at home and they're becoming more and more frail is the Frail Elder Waiver. So this started out as a demonstration project in Massachusetts, but now it's part of the Mass Health Regulations. So it does involve that you need to be eligible for mass health, but what it does is it gives a higher threshold for folks who are eligible for mass health. So the threshold is like $2,200 a month now. The only difference is you do need to have $2,000 or less in assets. So that's countable assets. So you can have $2,000 in the bank, you can have $2,000 worth of stocks. You can have $2,000 if that's the value of your cash-in life insurance policy. 
You can prepay your burial, so that's all set. That's not countable. Um, there is a look back the period of five years for you for Mass Health, and so you need to make sure that you haven't gifted large sums of money to people. To, that looks like you might be trying to make yourself eligible. But if there are concerns like that, you should talk to Arthur or one of his um, colleagues just to make sure that you're meeting all the requirements. If it's basically, you know, self-explanatory, if you really only have $2,000 in the bank and your income is less than that, you can have a car, you can have a house, those things you don't have to worry about. Um, then you would be eligible for Mass Health Standard, which you would need to go on the Frail Elder Waiver. And what the Frail Elder Waiver does is it really provides you with a lot more services that you would get from the traditional home care program. We have folks who we provide pretty much 24 seven care to so that they can stay at home and they're on the Frail Elder Waiver. Most of the time there really needs to be a caregiver involved also. And the reason for this is, you know, we contract with a number of different agencies, 15 different agencies to provide services. And you're probably all somewhat familiar with the very low unemployment rate in Massachusetts and across the nation. And that's great, except that it makes it really, really difficult for agencies to hire workers. It makes it difficult for me to hire case managers at my office. I mean, it's obviously the higher up you go, the easier it is to hire people. Um, but it is very a very, very tight labor market. And so homemakers and home health aides are often choosing to do other things because they can. You know, it's a, it's a valuable, valuable service that they provide, and there is some training involved, but you know, don't need to have a college degree. And frankly, these days you can get, you know, a job sometimes at Target or wherever for $15, $16 an hour, which is more than they make as a home health aide. So the reason you need to have a caregiver is really because, you know, it's difficult for the agencies to 100% guarantee that there's going to be service there. So you really need to have a backup plan. But it is something that is available to folks. And last I looked, I have never in my life seen anyone raising their hand saying, ooh, ooh, when can I go into the next nursing home bed? You know, nobody wants that. And we shouldn't have to have that. There are so many services available in the community now that are helping people to stay in their own homes, people should really try and access those services. And I'm not saying that there isn't a place for nursing homes, because sometimes people just are really not safe at home and they do need to go to a nursing home. Um, I'm just talking, I'm really. So actually, this eligibility helps, but basically what you need to have is two assistance with two ADLs. So we're looking at bathing, dressing, toileting, med management, those kinds of things. Funny, funny thing, the reason that most people go into a nursing home is because they can't manage their medications at home. So in response to that, there's a lot of different things. There's a, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the medication dispenser, but it's actually this little machine and somebody needs to preload all your medications. And in the morning it says, Teresa, it's time to take your medications. And so I toddle over there and get my little cup that drops down and take my medications. So there's a lot of things that are available to people now um, so that they can manage their medications in their home. Um, obviously something like that isn't, isn't good for someone who's confused or whatever because they're gonna be like, who is that talking? And you can actually, we had one for my mother and we actually recorded our own voices. Ma, you need to take your medicine. <laughs> She thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> um, oops, that's not mine. So these are a list of the services that we can provide. Basically, it's any in-home service, or if you want to go to an adult day health program, Mass Health will pay for that. We also can pay for nursing services. So I talked about the med management, but if you have the med management machine and you have nobody to load your meds, which sometimes is the case because family's far away or unfortunately you don't have any family left. Um, we will pay for a nurse to go in and preload the med box. You can preload it for two weeks at a time. 
So that's something that you can get for our services. And we could also pay for adaptations to your home. So there's actually a new program, which actually hasn't started yet, but cross your fingers, it should be starting soon, where it's actually a trio of people. It's actually a nurse, it's actually an occupational therapist, and a handyman who will go in and look at someone's environment and see what needs to change for them to be safer. So for instance, if all of a sudden you're confined to a wheelchair most of the time, we don't even think about the thresholds in our doors. But if you have an older house, the thresholds are a little bit higher and they're difficult to get over. So that would be something that that team could actually lower those thresholds so it was easier to get around in the wheelchair. So there's so many things now um, that the state is willing to do to try and help people stay in their own homes rather than go into a nursing home. And I would like to say it's because they want what the people want. And I think part of that is true. But let's face it, it's a heck of a lot cheaper to stay in your home, even with a lot of care, than it is to go into a nursing home. Because nursing home these days are anywhere from six to $12,000 a month. So if you think you're rich enough to afford a nursing home, you probably won't be able to afford it for long. And then you're going to have to go on mass health, which is really the only insurance that pays for a nursing home, unless you have long-term care insurance. And that's sort of a whole nother story. So I talked for a long time. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I would encourage you to call our office. We have all kinds of very smart people there who know all kinds of things that are available to folks in the community. We just talked about the Frail Elder Waiver, but there's also adult family care or adult foster care, which is available to someone who is on Mass Health, And that's where your caregiver actually gets paid a stipend to take care of you. The only caveat to that is it can't be um, a spouse or the legal guardian. But there are many people who take their moms or their dads into their own home or both and would be eligible for adult foster care. And you can get a stipend of anywhere between 26 and about $55 a day. And the beauty of that is it's not taxable. And so you can either keep that to, to help take care of your parents, or you can purchase private care for your parents with that money for the time that you're not available. There's a whole host of things that you can do with that. So say that again. It's called the Adult Foster Care Plan. Yeah. And if you're interested in that, you can call Bay Path. Are you, pu you pulling me off the stage? OK. You're welcome. And my apologies for being late. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So and we've, as you know, we've oops. As you know, we've often had folks from Bay Path here, and, and they're just, it's a great organization, and they can really help Mary. They're the one organization that really can provide kind of comprehensive services to Mary, uh, just to keep, if, if, if she's really frail, and otherwise, if she would be stuck being in a nursing home. Now, once again, assuming that those are Mary's assets, this is, if, if Mary is, it's, at this point, it may, Mary may think it's a little late to be doing any kind of asset protection, because as, as, as Teresa has just pointed out, to qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver, Mary would have to show that she had less than $5,000 in countable assets. She would also have to show that she didn't give it away within the last five years. If, she, if her husband were still alive, she could give everything to her husband and then immediately qualify, but that's not an option right now, right? But I'm just gonna, I just wanna mention one other thing in terms of, of whether she might still wanna qualify for MassHealth by doing some things, even though MassHealth uh, will ultimately be able to get reimbursed for the payments that it makes. That is nursing, if she were in a, if she were in a nursing home, if during this, this five year period she needed nursing home care, that cost is gonna be um, probably about $150,000 a year. Her income is 24,000, so really she's gonna be um, eating up $126,000 a year worth of assets, which means over a five year period she's gonna be eating up about $630,000. She actually has $800,000 in assets. So that if she gave everything away right now at 90, and it turned out she lived longer than five years, she could then qualify for Mass Health by having that pool of money that she had given away to a daughter or to a trust or whatever, pay for that carry during that time, and she would still end up 
or her children would still end up with some money after she died, right? So she, she's got some options. At this point, it probably would make no sense for her to be doing an irrevocable trust, uh, to be transferring assets into an irrevocable trust, although she should be talking to her attorney about it. But the, the point is, at, you know, at this point, what Mary is really trying to do is stay home for as long as she can. Um, but she is at the point, kind of to use a metaphor, she, you know, she is just kind of going along at that point um, and trying to stay at home. But at some point, she's going to get to the point which in Katie Butler's book is called awareness of mortality, which I would say metaphorically is the point at which you're kind of on the boat and you're going along and you can see the shore in the distance. Now, you're not at the shore, but you can see the shore in the distance. So you're starting to look at this period of your life, which is going to end in your death, which is going to end in your death. And you're not going, and the goal during that period is not to not die. I mean, nice concept, but I always, I had a client who once said, you know, Michael, I'm never going to die. And I said, that's an interesting idea. You should have a plan B though, just in case, right? So, so the, in this chapter, which is called awareness of mortality, the doctor is saying to you, you have a serious illness or you have a terminal illness or you have stage four cancer. Or, that you have a, or you have a vital organ that's just not doing very well, whether that's your heart or your lungs or your liver or your brain, you just, your memory's going bad. Um, or you're in the early stages of Lou Gehrig's disease, of, of, of ALS, so you've, 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 you, you know where all of this is going. Your doctor is kind of not giving you a prognosis or is saying, oh, it's not good, or it's poor, or it's dire, or doctors are word, using words like chronic, progressive, serious, uh, and doctors are talking to you about your goals of care as opposed to cure. So when you're Mary at that point, you really want to be you really there, you really want to be thinking out a whole bunch of things. The best person that you can talk to about that is probably your primary care physician. Probably not the specialist who had been taking care of you to cure something that was trying to get cured, but rather the person that you can kind of trust to be talking to you about. How do you live as good, well as you can live during these last months of your life? So I asked Dr. Michelle Ricard, who was a doctor, retired, kind of retired now, never, they, they never really retire, uh, but who's a, geronto a gerontologist for her, for her life, to talk a little bit about that and talk about how she would talk to Mary if Mary were expressing these kinds of, of, of uh, symptoms or issues. Dr. Ricard. Thank you, Arthur. <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wanted to use the um, the board here, so if I if I write on here, can everybody see it or does it? Okay. Um, so what I want to start off is by asking you to tell me some things that would make you happy in your last year. Um, for example, um, being able to see the outside environment, you know, for as long as you can, just as an just as an example. So. Um, I'll say watching the fall foliage. Um, okay, so anybody have any thoughts about what they would like for them, for you, um, in that last year? What are some of the things that you'd like to be able to still be doing? Because you're alive and you're, you're not dead until you're dead. So we, we need to talk about how to make your life the best that it can be at this point. So any, any other ideas? Out to dinner. Out to dinner. Okay. Me, so eating, eating. Family. Excellent. Okay. Great. Um, <clears throat> Some people have said they want to be home. They want to be in their own bed. So let's put down here home, their own bed. Pain free. Pain free. Okay, excellent. Being, being in as best health as you can. So you, you want your health to be as good as it can. And Arthur's already said that I ha the health is declining. That's true but we want to maintain that health for as much as we can, whatever health we can. So we'll, we'll put health down. Because health is not the absence of disease. It's coping with whatever our body is dealing, it, it has dealt us. Um, okay, 
uh, family. We'll put friends down here as well. I'm realizing my writing is terrible. Um, okay, so um, so the, these are some of the things then that we would like to be able to experience in that last year. So basically then, um, if we put down here goals, um, these can be summarized as if we want to be with family and friends and we want to be watching full foliage and we want to be at home, we need to be able to maintain our vision. So vision is an important goal. We want to be able to maintain that as best as we can. Um, we like going out and eating, so we want to be able to eat. So having a feeding tube, for example, or having something that would prevent you from eating would not be something that you would want as a goal. So we'll put down eating. You want to be able to eat, which means putting something in the mouth and swallowing and the whole thing. Um, if you want to share meals and spend time with family and friends, you need to be able to hear and you need to be able to talk. So these are some of the other goals. So communication, we want to be able to communicate. Um, hearing, speaking. Okay. Excellent. So let's move on now um, to, is anybody here? Um, <clears throat> Over the age of uh, over the age of ninety, ninety or above. Okay, yeah. all right. So, but we're all we're all heading there. I have to say we're heading there. So we are we are heading there. Um, some of the changes that happen um, when we get into our nineties are what we call physiological or normal aging changes. Um, when I was starting off in my practice, ageism was a big topic, and if you said Oh, if the doctor said you're old, then they were being, they were manifesting ageism. And the last thing we wanted to do was to tell someone, well, that's because you're old. Mm -hmm. And we still don't like to do that um, because we like to see if there's any underlying conditions that we can change um, and make you, make you be better. But there are certain physiological things that happen. Normal aging happens. Um, so some of the changes, can anybody think of some changes that will categorize them as whether they're physiological or age-related diseases later. But some of the things that you've seen or are experiencing uh, with, with aging, particularly at the age of 90, some of the things that, that we talk about. Mobility, Mobility excellent. <clears throat> Difficulty with mobility, correct. Sight, yes. The vision starts to go down. Okay. Hearing. Hearing, that's right. That's a very common problem, isn't it? Hearing. Memory. How about reaction time? Reaction time goes down, whether we like it or not. It does go down, that's, and that's normal. We've got to put reaction time down here. And endurance goes down. Who doesn't have grandchildren that we just that just go tearing off, and no matter how hard we try, we just cannot keep up with them. Okay, so your endurance goes down, and that's a physiological thing. We can't change that. You know, a weightlifter who's weight lifting fantastic weights at 40 cannot lift those weights at 90. They just can't do it. Now they're going to be probably better than someone who's never lifted weights, but they, the muscle just is, isn't there. So your endurance goes down. Now I am going somewhere with all these things, you'll see in a minute. Um, taste goes down, things don't taste as good anymore. We want more seasoning, we want more salt and pepper on things. So taste and smell, they both go down. Okay. Um, digestion, how, how does digestion change? Right, appetite maybe not, not quite as big. They've shown that digestion actually doesn't change in terms of what the stomach and 
intestines do, although there are some age-related things that can happen with that, but in general, that kind of works okay. But yeah, appetite goes down, right. But appetite may go down because we don't taste and smell as, as well. So think the food just doesn't have that interest anymore. And we may not feel like the energy, energy goes down. We don't have the energy to cook anymore. You know, it's just too, too much of a hassle to use the stove, even the microwave. All right, so other things, frailty. People, people get frail. And then other things I just wanted to put in here, things like um, atherosclerosis, strokes, coronary artery disease, things that the organs that our blood vessel supplies. So we'll just, we'll, I'll put down arteries, but what I'm really referring to is disease of the arteries, okay? And, um, and then diabetes, okay. And hypertension. Oops, what am I doing here? I'm trying to write sideways, doesn't work. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so some of these things, like I said, um, vision, vision is normally good as we age. Only if we get a disease that is it affected. <coughs> Cataracts can be removed. Macular degeneration is a disease. It's not part of normal aging. So the only things, like I said, that really go down is, rea is physiologically reaction time, endurance, um, and that, yeah, everything else really is just part of um, diseases that affect us. Mobility is affected by degenerative joint disease. You know. Um, so where do all these things lead us? Well, they lead us to the things that some of our speakers were talking about, that if you don't have reaction time, um, if you don't have reaction time, then you're not going to be good in traffic and behind the wheel of a car. So driving becomes an issue. So these are some of the, um, these are some of the issues. So what happened is at, at 90, People say, like, like Arthur mentioned, you don't, you don't, you, you feel a burden to your family. Or some people say, I, I don't want to be a burden to my family anymore because they need to be picked up and taken places or whatever. So all of what we're going to list here are some of the things which you're going to lose and the independence that that you're going to lose. The these these conditions here clip our independence wings. So um, we're going to lose driving. We're going to lose some of the abilities to, to cook and go shopping, the, the independent activities of daily living that somebody, uh, one of the other speakers referred to. Um, we're going to have difficulty walking. Um, so difficulty with stairs um, and getting, getting in and out of the house. Um, cleaning, you want someone to come in and clean for you because you just, you just don't have the ability to do that anymore. Um, so, um, and we mentioned cooking and driving and those things. So this is where the um, assistance comes in at, at, at this point, and you need to have accrued these things or get these things when you have these, when you're at this situation. How can we mitigate against these? How can we have strategies to prevent these affecting us as much as they can do? So I like to divide that into sort of three, se three sections. Strategies for the mind, strategies for the body, strategies for the spirit. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> under, under the mind, um, I'm mean, sort of including, I'm sort of referring to this as the brain. The brain, yes, it's housed in our cranium, but it's really just blood vessels and nerves. I mean, with that, with all the connective tissue and, and everything else. So <clears throat> how do we keep that healthy? We want to keep the brain as healthy as you possibly can. So we keep the neurons happy by making sure that the blood vessels are healthy, and the blood vessels need to be healthy by giving the, the body the proper food to nourish those blood vessels and keep them. So you know about cholesterol and, and all those things. So green leafy vegetables, fruits, other vegetables, and... Um, Staying away from dairy and all that stuff will help those arteries stay healthy. And it's not just the big arteries. We don't talk about 
The arteries are everywhere, even little, little ones that are up in the brain. And if, if those brain cells are not nourished by the arteries, then the neurons, the nerves won't work. And we can talk about all the stuff that gets built up and causes Alzheimer's. I think the cause of Alzheimer's is vascular. It has to do with our blood vessel health. So we need to keep the blood vessels healthy. Um, green leafy vegetables release nitric oxide. Nitric oxide dilates the blood vessels, keeps them open, keeps them expanding. Um, and so um, <clears throat> anyway, staying with the mind for a minute, we need to do mind mind games. Uh, does anybody here do that? What's it called? Haiku, or whatever it is, where you have Sudoku. Oh my good, I cannot get Sudoku. I just can't get it. <laughs> but you know, it's it's. Uh, I really haven't sat down and tried really really hard. But it, I, it's complicated. But that's a great mind game. Does anybody else here do Sudoku? Or excellent, excellent. Any other mind games that anybody else plays? Crossverse puzzles, excellent, excellent. <clears throat> Anything that you can learn that's new is good. You know, at 90, you can, still, you can still take a college course and learn new stuff. It, and as long as you are stimulating those neurons with new stuff, then you will keep them as active as they can be. I'm not saying that you, you know, can live forever. As Arthur pointed out, nobody lives forever. <clears throat> but you can keep those neurons as functional as they can be. And that's, that's the whole goal. The whole goal is to be as healthy as you can, and then when, when, when the end happens, it happens, you know. So socializing is good. Having conversations with people means your brain's got to be alert to engage in that to and fro of conversation. And when you lose your hearing and your vision, um, it's harder to have that communication. So that's where getting hearing aids and, you know, vision things, whatever that you need to do. Okay, so that's the mind for the body. <clears throat> we've talked a lot about the blood vessels, but we've got to talk about mobility and arthritis, and the things you can do for that are exercise. Anybody here go to the gym? Excellent, all right. So um, at the gym, we need to do aerobic exercises to get the heart rate up. We need to do weightlifting exercises to keep the bones healthy. And I'll put a plug in here for Tai Chi, for balance, we need to do something for balance, uh, or matter of balance is, an, is another program that's offered. So for the body, bones and joints, connective tissues and all that stuff. And then for the spirit, <clears throat> then however, however you connect with a higher being, whether that's a organized religion or some other spiritual connection, you need to have that as well, because that kind of just helps tie, tie it all in together and nourishes you. Um, so in summary, then, we need to exercise, we need to put the right nourishment into our bodies, and we need to be social. Now, having said all that, we've got to come back to goals, and we've got to remember that it's wonderful to have these goals, and you should have them, but you need to communicate them. And the, as Arthur pointed out, you need to communicate these goals to your doctor, and you, you need a doctor who's interested in hearing about your goals and not just listening to your heart, pounding a little bit on your abdomen and saying, okay, you've had your annual physical or something. You need to have someone who knows you, who engages with you, and understand what your goals are. And as the other speaker pointed out, geriatric case manager or um, your family needs to know, you know what, your, what your goals are so that when you are at 90 and in your 90s and things are starting to deteriorate and um, not go the way that you thought they would, your family know at least what your major goals are. If the doctor says to you, you need such and such a surgery, you need a, something to be done, how does that get to my goal? Is that part of my goal to have that procedure, that test, that surgery, you know, whatever it is? It, it's it's got to be, it's got to be uh, consistent with your goal. So other people have to know your goals. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm not going to talk about the MOLS form. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I think what I, I want to just let you know that you, you have control over things. You don't have control about when you die, but you have control about how healthy you can be and the choices you can make leading up to that. So thank you. Doctor, thank you very much. You're welcome. So I think.
<laughs> and that's Dr. Dr. Ricard. What you really all you well, it really all need is you need a doctor like Dr. Ricard, <laughs> right? You need really somebody who can be really helping you during those those times. So um, I'd like to have Rebecca and I just kind of talk talk to that kind of subset of things that she would be trying to help Mary to deal with if Mary knew that, I don't want to say the end was near, but that she was living in the last year of her life. Rebecca? Sarah. Right, Rebecca, Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> this Sorry. is just not a good day. I, I, I take it as a compliment that he's calling me Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, so nearing the last year of your life, um, Hopefully we have been working together for a while. I, I know what your goals are. I know what you, what's important to you. As we're going to doctor's appointments together and the doctors are saying, oh, we need to fix this, we need to do surgery, I would be having, that, I would be having a conversation with you about, is this consistent with your goals? I'd be trying to support your wishes and not have you feel bamboozled by the doctor or that you just have to do what the doctor says. I might, as we're getting closer and closer, I might be talking to you about hospice. Hospice mm -hmm. is a service. It's not a place that you go to die. And it doesn't mean that you're gonna die within the next couple of weeks. It's a Medicare provided service, the focus of which is quality of life. So hospice can provide a lot of things to keep you in your home, maintain your health and your comfort longer. So assuming that we decide, okay, yes, it's gonna be hospice, I'm gonna be helping you communicate with them and probably with, or helping Mary communicate with her kids, Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. who are in California um, and have, not been visiting and are not really aware of what's going on, I would be helping Mary have that conversation with her kids. Look, it's just getting too hard. I'm tired. I don't want to um, you know, have surgery. I just want to have quality of life. So we'd be telling them. We'd maybe be inviting them to come in and visit a little bit more often. Uh, I'd be connecting Mary with hospice, helping hospice understand who Mary is, what she wants to wants her life to look like, what's important to her. Um, we had a client recently who um, loved animals and was living in a memory care unit at a assisted living facility. We told hospice and they had a therapy dog come and just sit with her for a while. She liked being outside. We, we were able to get a, a chair um, that could get her outside in a way that a wheelchair couldn't. So she sat outside in the beautiful sun with the dog on her lap and it was a beautiful, joyful day. And that's part of what we try to help create um, as people are entering that really last stage. Um, we also will do, you know, sometimes we do creative things. If someone's having trouble hearing, we might have headphones and a pocket talker to help them be able to hear better when people are visiting. Um, just a variety of different, you know, if they love McDonald's, we might run out and get McDonald's for them. It may not be the best choice in the world, but it's about what they want and quality of life. I think that covers. I just want to mention, so I was talking to uh, Sarah's partner, Rebecca Wild Wesley, we were having a meeting a while ago, and she said, I have to go, I have to stop at Target and pick up more toilet paper for my client. I said, you have to pick up yes. toilet paper? She said, yes. She said, this was, this was actually a woman that you've been working with for years. Um, and she was going into the kind of the last stages of her life. And she said, I promised this lady she was living at home. She'd never run out of toilet paper. So I got to make sure we got <laughs> enough toilet paper. So th the point is that, that if, if what you, as opposed to just hiding, when you're thinking about this last year of your life, the, the goal of the exercise is to try to, to reach out, obviously, and to, as opposed to just imposing everything on your kids. The goal of this, of this part of your life is to kind of reach out to some people that may be able to just help you think about how to deal with making every day as good as it can be. So and that's, that's, I wanted to, to ask Doug Peck from Seniors Helping Seniors, who is, which is a kind of a, a home care agency that works through this area, hiring nothing but seniors, to be kind of talking about some of those issues, like the things that you may be wanting to think about as, you, as you're Mary and you're approaching the last couple of months and the last couple of weeks of your life, Doug. Mm -hmm. Oops, yeah, I'm gonna. Oh, 
Okay. We go right there. That's good. Yeah, I'll go there. There. Thank you. Hi, everyone. As Arthur said, my name is Doug Peck, and I uh, work for a home care agency called Seniors Helping Seniors. And for me, this scenario really resonates because we uh, deal with people both in their home, assisted livings, independent livings, and sometimes eventually nursing homes. And I would say 70 to 75% of our clients is somebody like Mary, in that they are now all alone. The spouse has passed away, uh, and they are uh, living in, a, you know, in some place where there's, they're not the neighborhoods that there were anymore, the families aren't as close anymore, and so they really are more by themselves. And what we provide is really that kind of companion care, it gives a person uh, someone to talk to, someone to really help think through some of these things. Because, you know, these ideas are ones that are complicated. I mean, they, you would think it would be easy just to die. And a lot, it's, it's not anymore because we have so much good medicine around that can keep us uh, alive for so much longer than ever before. But we don't have necessarily the structure or the social structure around us to help as well. Um, but I want to go with one of the things that Dr. Ricard was talking about, which was what can you control? And there is still another, this is Mary's goal, whatever the situation is, make the best of it. But you are still in control of some very important things besides what you can eat, the games you play, et cetera. And it comes down, if you are seriously ill, you need to be thinking about who is your healthcare proxy? Who is going to make medical decisions for you if you're in a state where uh, your doctor has determined that you're not capable of making those decisions anymore? And it's really more, that's the first place you start. Is it going to be a person in your family? Is it going to be a family friend? Is it going to be a neighbor? Who is it going to be? What I want to give you a little bit is sort of what their responsibility looks like, because if you understand that, you understand two things. One is, will shape who you are going to choose, and two, it's also going to shape what you're going to talk to them about. Because it is a very, the first one is, is sort of really medically related. What kind of medical treatment do you want or don't want? And again, I would defer to uh, asking your doctor about this because there are things that um, you know, we hear about, we see on TV all the time, for example, CPR. We see somebody, you know, almost every night if you're watching the cop show or whatever, somebody's giving somebody CPR. When you're 90, Dr. Rashad, what happens when you get CPR? <clears throat> CPR results, well, you, you do the chest compression. Right. And so one of the first things that happened in a 90-year-old person is that you break ribs. <clears throat> and so the success rate of CPR in someone over the age of 75 mm -hmm. is only about 15%. It is really low. So I, that's what I mean about these are serious things to think about. We hear CPR, we hear that stuff all the time, but you need to ask your doctor about it because you are pressing down two inches, two inches. right? And so you're, it might be what you want. And it, you know, but just be aware that you're gonna be in pain afterwards, you're gonna have a recovery period from that, and your chances are not that great. So when you talk about life support, go to the doctor and ask them to talk about what does it mean? What does it mean to be intubated? What does it mean to have a feeding tube? What does it mean to do this type of thing? It's really something you need to know from a medical standpoint as you're getting to be this age. Um, but there are other things as well, and we're talking about sort of comfort care. You know, everybody, I assume, doesn't want to be in pain. Uh, some people want to say, look, I, I specifically want to make sure that I'm, I really like to be clean and safe and comfortable all the time. You know, that means I want to be, ba even if I'm not necessarily awake or aware of it from your perspective, I still want to be bathed every day. And you can, you can ask specifically to do that. 
you can say, I wish to have my favorite music play, and my favorite music is this. I think it's really important because, again, the whole point is in dealing with the situation now that you don't, you don't have a lot of control over, but if you make your wishes known to someone, your proxy, they're going to fulfill them, and it's going to make, towards the end, a lot more comfortable. Um, you also want, uh, you can control how people can treat you. I want to have people with me. I, maybe you do, maybe you don't want to have people with me. You may want to say, I want to have members of my faith community come in and see me, even though I might not be necessarily, again, aware of everything. I may want to have the priest, the rabbi, the pastor there on a regular basis. Um, I don't want people around to be sad. I want, I want them, if they're going to come and see me, I want them to sort of help celebrate my life a little bit and what I've accomplished. Um, so there's, again, it, these are areas that you don't necessarily think a lot about, but they're really important for getting that little extra kind of quality care towards the end. Um, this is another one. I mean, families are very <laughs> complicated. Everybody has some sort of dysfunction in their family. So you may want to say, I wish to be forgiven for times I did this or that. I want to see uh, Uncle Joe, although, you know, he's my younger brother. I haven't seen him in 10 years, and I would really like to see him before I go and, and make amends. Important things for people to do because it, not, it doesn't just affect you. It has a ripple effect throughout your whole family. Um, I, I, I want memories of my life to give my, fam, my family and friends joy and not sorrow. So as people... Um, we talked about pre-planning a funeral. You can sort of pre-plan. What would you What would you like at the end? I, do I, you know, do you want a, Do you want a traditional wake? Do you want something that's different, more celebratory? How do you want to do all of this? You know, it's not necessarily easy to think about. I have listed some things in the program, though. There are places you can go that will um, give you some other ideas. They are right here. Five wishes, honoring choices, the conversation project. Um, What's the name of the, that card deck now? There's a, go, the, it's called wish. the Go Wish game. Yeah. And I, I didn't bring my cards with me, but if you Google the Go Wish game, it will help you think about all these different things. And what it is essentially, what they use is a pack of like playing cards that says, I want my family around me all the time, or I don't. And you take them and prioritize them. This is something I'd really like to have, this is something that would be nice, and this is, I don't, want, I don't want this. So it just helps you to think about all these things. Because again, I just think it really makes, you know, as you're going towards the end, just that more uh, personal. It gives you a sense of control of what's going to happen. Uh, and it just make, gives you a quality right towards the very end. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And, and by the way, I really, really appreciate the fact that, that uh, Northbrook Cable is filming this because one of the things about this presentation is that a lot of the people who kind of need to be seeing it uh, are people who aren't here, right? Who couldn't be here because they're dealing with stuff at home right now or they just can't get out, right? I just wanna, I wanna close with a couple of quick legal things. First, uh, if you have a MOLST form, M-O-L-S-T, Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment, things that say, you know, th th that, that deal with issues like if, I, if my heart has stopped, don't start, don't start it, the, no, the, do the so-called do not resuscitate, or if I've stopped breathing, I really want to, you know, I don't want to be kept alive, I don't want to go to the hospital. You may want to revisit this most if you're married in the last year of your life, because it may be that you really did want to be resuscitated, but now you're saying to yourself, no, you know, really, you know, if, if this is going to be the last year of my life, I just assume, it, you know, go out and go out comfortably as opposed to having anybody kill themselves to try to save me. Um, so you want to revisit the most, you want to have just the kind of conversation that Doug was just talking about with the person who is your proxy. Because think of all those decisions that you might need to be making, whether you're at home or in a nursing home or in a hospital, because you want to be treated in a particular way, but you can't say it at that point. You don't have the ability to say it, but you're still hearing things and you're still seeing things. Would it be nice if you were actually be treating the way, treated the way you could actually, you would want to be treated if you could say it, right? So somebody really needs to know about all of that stuff. One other thing, 
In terms of planning, you want to make sure you've talked to your, the person who is your power of attorney agent, uh, because by this point you need a power of attorney, and assuming, or presumably Mary has it. Among other things, because for many folks, one of, the, one of their goals in life is to make things simple for their children after they die. For people who own things when they die, at the moment that they die, those assets are gonna to need to go through the probate process before anything can be distributed to any of their kids. The process is gonna take at least a year. If, if you've got an attorney, right, that, and when I say an attorney, you're, you're a named person in your power of attorney, your son or your daughter, what you may wanna tell that person, if you've got these kids and your goal in life was to simply divide all the assets among your kids and you still have assets that are in your name, you tell them, you say, look, if you know that I'm going to die, that I am in the last days or weeks or even months of my life, so that I don't need these assets now, I'm not gonna need them, give them away now. Give them away now. Because if the assets get given away before Mary dies, they don't have to go through the probate process. And the person who has the power of attorney, if it's correctly drafted, can give away everything on your behalf so that no one will have to go through any of those, any of those issues after you die. So um, as I say, the, the, the legal part of this is fairly straightforward. The main thing is to be talking to a whole set of people. And if you're Mary, be trying to think this stuff out ahead of time, because the worst time to make any of these decisions is in, during an emergency. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, if you uh, have just dying to see this presentation again, because you didn't get it all, uh, as you know, um, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary and read that book, read that book. The Art of Dying Well by Katie Butler, it's really terrific. And it can really help you kind of think out a lot of these issues. Thank you very much. Any questions? No? Could I ask for a quick round of applause for my wonderful guests, right? Thank you very much all, thank you very much to you all for coming. Thank you all for coming and uh, we'll see you next year, right? Happy holidays, happy Thanksgiving, happy holidays, thank you.